C'est la dernière séance de l'année sur l'imagination artificielle. Donc on est très très heureux de re recevoir euh, Matteo Pascalini et Mario Klickman. Euh, alors ils ont deux profils très différents. D'abord je suis content qu'ils se, ils se rencontrent l'un et l'autre parce que je pense qu'ils se connaissaient à distance de longue date et puis euh, de se rencontrer. Euh, alors pourquoi on les a invités pour finir euh, C'était euh, que comme vous le savez, euh, ce concept d'imagination artificielle qu'on a essayé de, de, de conceptualiser cette année et où c'était vraiment de la recherche puisque euh, euh, ce concept n'est pas un concept au jour d'aujourd'hui qui est clairement défini. Celui d'intelligence artificielle déjà pose quelques problèmes, mais celui d'imagination artificielle est extrêmement problématique, surtout dans la manière dont on l'a pris. Et, et on voulait finir avec euh, nos deux intervenants parce que euh, c'est deux personnes qui travaillent très très fortement, très directement sur euh, la question euh, qui nous concerne, qui est à l'entrecroisement de l'intelligence et de l'imagination artificielle. Alors, Matteo Pascalini, je connais son travail depuis de très nombreux, de quelques années. Si vous allez sur son site, vous verrez qu'il a une production euh, académique conséquente. C'est, on peut dire, un philosophe des médias. Euh, mais est-ce que c'est le bon terme il est, il est enseignant à Karlsruhe. Et ça fait euh, plusieurs années qu'il qu travaille, bien sûr, sur la question des technologies. Et ça fait plusieurs années qu'il a euh, une, une de, des parties de son travail, c'est de réfléchir à la question de l'intelligence artificielle en opérant euh, plusieurs... Euh, plus, en, en faisant plusieurs opérations. Euh, et vous allez le voir. D'abord, c'est quelqu'un qui essaye de comprendre comment marchent les logiciels. C'est-à-dire qui essaye de faire la narration des logiciels. Software narratology, something like that. Euh, et euh, et euh, donc de ne pas avoir une analyse de l'intelligence des logiciels d'intelligence artificielle qui serait une analyse purement conceptuelle et très générale. Il part du fonctionnement de ces logiciels et il produit, entre autres, un certain nombre de schémas euh, d'analyse de, de, de ces logiciels qui nous permet d'interpréter leur fonctionnement autrement que comme simplement le ça, ça se fait dans le domaine de l'ingénierie informatique, pas uniquement donc du point de vue instrumental, mais du point de vue aussi de la signification de ces logiciels et de leur structure. C'est aussi quelqu'un qui travaille beaucoup sur les, les sous-entendus, les présupposés politiques de l'intelligence artificielle. Il avait commencé sa carrière sur la question politique de l'activisme. Euh, et après, ce qui fait que c'est resté dans son travail la question de l'intelligence artificielle, de la domination des structures politiques et des biais. Et je pense qu'aujourd'hui, il va, il va nous proposer euh, une, une approche de l'intelligence artificielle autour de deux questions absolument passionnantes. C'est la question de l'espace, de la spatialisation et de la compression. Et je pense qu'il arrivera sûrement a démontré que, euh, quelque part, l'intelligence artificielle est une compression de nos subjectivités. Qu'il y a un rapport entre euh, spatialisation vectorielle, compression et subjectivité, et comment aujourd'hui, l'intelligence artificielle est un symptôme, est un symptôme euh, privilégié. Ce n'est pas seulement une technologie, c'est un symptôme euh, de la manière dont nos subjectivités s'élaborent. D'où le fait que l'analyse qu'il a, vous savez, la, la fameuse analyse que que tous les médias ont sur les, sur les biais de l'intelligence artificielle, euh, et bien lui, l'analyse dans un autre cadre beaucoup plus, je crois, intéressant et profond. Donc j'ai très très hâte d'entendre de, ce qu'il va, qu va raconter. Quand à, à Mario, <rire> euh, quand à Mario, qui j'espère va, va comprendre quelques mots, donc ça fait euh, de, de nombreuses années aussi que je connais son travail, puisque ça remonte à la flash scene, euh, a long time ago, sorry euh, donc qui était, euh, qui était à un moment, donc euh, Mario est, euh, est, est designer et artiste, on va dire aussi euh, designer expérimental, euh, je pense que ça peut être une notion. Euh, et euh, j'ai découvert son travail quand euh, l'action script et le flash, c'était euh, ce qu'on faisait tous, bon, époque maudite, euh, et, euh, et où Mario faisait des expérimentations extrêmement impressionnantes qu'il mettait en ligne sur la générativité, c'est-à-dire sur la capacité des machines à produire des résultats autonomes. Donc ça fait des années qu'il travaille sur la question de la programmation, de l'art et de l'autonomie. Et cette question de l'autonomie, elle a un double sens, comme vous le savez, c'est l'autonomie des logiciels, euh, c'est l'autonomie, et c'est aussi la question de l'autonomie dans l'art. Qu'est-ce que c'est que l'autonomie dans l'art Donc il était, euh, on était tous absolument fanatiques de son travail et très, très impressionnés par son travail. Il mettait beaucoup en ligne son travail euh, et, et, et donc il y avait une générosité. Et depuis quelques années, il s'est spécialisé dans le deep ou machine learning, quel que soit le mot qu'on utilise. 
Et il est, à mon avis, dans le monde, l'un de ceux qui produit les résultats les plus impressionnants au niveau de la génération en deep et machine learning, en, en, au niveau des images, euh, et des images réalistes. Euh, il, fait des, il, il a des résultats tout à, fait, euh, tout à fait impressionnants. Il a gardé de la, fla, de la, de la scène flash euh, la générosité de mettre en ligne euh, quotidiennement quasiment euh, ses expérimentations. Euh, donc, on peut le suivre sur Twitter et suivre un peu son carnet de notes, un peu comme un carnet d'esquisses d'artistes. Et il avance pas à pas, il expérimente. Peut-être qu'il ne sait pas précisément où il va, mais on peut suivre son cheminement point par point. Parmi les dernières expérimentations, il y a des expérimentations de flux euh, liquides. Euh, et euh, il est actuellement résident au Google Art Institute de Paris. Euh, donc, qui, comme vous le savez, peut-être qu'on en parlera, Google voulant s'implanter en Europe, s'est implanté à Paris. Et voulant s'implanter à Paris, a mis au cœur de ses préoccupations l'art et la culture. Euh, ça, c'est qui est une, donc une véritable, un véritable enjeu. Et il nous parlera donc de ses expérimentations. Je pense qu'il collabore aussi avec le duo d'artistes euh, Fabien Giraud et euh, Siboni. Il y a actuellement, je pense, euh, une pièce que vous pouvez aller voir. Vous pouvez aller voir l'exposition de Fabien et, et Raphaël Siboni euh, à la Fondation euh, Ricard, euh, qui est une très très bonne exposition. Je vous recommande d'y aller, qui retrace une histoire parallèle de la cybernétique et de l'informatique. Euh, et dedans, je pense qu'il y a une pièce sur laquelle euh, tu as travaillé, euh, qui est donc une pièce euh, euh, en, en réseau de neurones, en, en Generative Adversarial Network, euh, et qui, donc, je vous recommande d'aller voir, c'est en, ce en ce moment même à Paris. Donc voilà, donc, euh, c'est à toi, c'est ton tour. It's your turn to, to talk now. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I only heard flash, <laughs> which is, of course, long, long time gone. But uh, well, it is my history. Also, it's good that you sit so far away because I, I must send that in front. It's not somebody mocked me on the street. I managed to, to run into a metal pole today whilst checking my phone. So my nose is a little bit. So in the close up, so don't look so closely. Oh, actually, I should maybe switch to the talk. Yes. And, uh, So yes, uh, thank you very much for having me here today. And uh, sorry that I can't do this talk in French, but yes, uh, as I just mentioned, I somehow had the weird idea to learn ancient Greek in school and not French. So uh, yeah, it, I still kind of uh, uh, yeah, uh, regret it. So today's talk uh, is called Instruments of Creation. Uh, well, the subtitle is uh, Art in the Age of Artificial Production, which is this uh, kind of uh, take on Walter Benjamin's famous uh, um, paper book, uh, what was it, article about like art in the age of, uh, art, of uh, artificial production, uh, reproduction. So yes, because I think we have reached a, a kind of a new age, or we are reaching a new age where we cannot only reproduce uh, images, but we are now setting the stage where machines are able to produce, well, art, or at least uh, things that are interesting to humans. and. Uh, our role might become less that one of a creator. And uh, that is kind of what I am exploring roughly since, well, 25 years. But over the last three years, when deep learning and machine learning has really reached that technological stage where we can produce images that are well, have a certain quality. Uh, well, I've kind of almost exclusively went to experimenting with this field. So, Just to give you a few examples, so here are some images that, well, I mean, I still say I made them, but in a way, the machine made them by models I trained, and I become, in the end, more like a mixture between a creator and a curator. Because, well, as I will explain in the following uh, 40 minutes, well, the process is not really that I tell the machine anymore where to set the pixels or actually what to show me. In the end, I'm just going through, well, thousands of images and, uh, and have to, to select the ones that speak to me. So yeah, so all of them are really kind of not Photoshop anymore or nothing where uh, they are just the results of uh, various neural networks processing data. 
Uh, I'm not sure like how much you know about kind of this whole field of deep learning. I guess you do. Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, uh, I wanted to go to this. Yes. So because why do I call this talk instruments of creation? Well, the thing is, well, hum humans like one of the things that defines us as humans is our ability to to use tools. In a way, our whole culture is shaped by the evolution of tools, which allow us then like which augment our first our physical abilities. Let's go back to the something like the the rock axe or a lever, and. Over the years, these tools, or over the centuries, uh, millennia, they allowed us to build finer tools, uh, tools that are allowed to, to, to do things with more precision. And uh, at some point, tools even become instruments. And even like if you have something like a piano, well, you don't call this a tool, but a piano is still something that allows humans to do things that with our body functions or our voices, we cannot do. And so in the same thing, I see these neural networks or deep learning now as another tool or instrument in our tool set, which not only, well, not, uh, cannot augment our physical abilities, but it can actually augment our, maybe our imagination and creativity. And so at the end, it's still something we have to, well, we wield, but uh, of course the, 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 the boundaries get a bit more blurry. So yes, but let's get to this. So I will quickly go into the deep learning thing because I really don't know like how much you have actually know about this. Well, as you might have heard, uh, deep learning was uh, kind of invented to turn cats into data or uh, let's say images of cats into data. And if you have uh, like an image of a cat, well, an image, a digital image is already a lot of data, but uh, well, because every pixel is kind of like an RGB value and an XY coordinate. Problem is it's way too much data and it's way too redundant. So well, and if the model, like a, a neural network wants to kind of like look at an image and decide if there is a cat or a dog on it, well, there are these tools. For example, the classic one is the convolutional neural network which is this uh, kind of pyramid structure made out of different layers that are loosely kind of modeled on, the, on how human neurons work. But it's kind of more like a, kind of like a rough model. But astonishingly, it works quite well. Uh, if you look inside, so it's really like you send pixels in at the top, the image. And then there are these convolutional layers that look a little bit like uh, if you have Photoshop and run it through some kind of bad, like weird edge detection filters. So in the early layers, uh, I'm not sure it's a bit bad to see, but you can still see some traces of the image. But every one of these convolutional filters looks at different aspects of, of the image, let's say edges or certain textures, and then sends this information to the next layer which, so this information is already a reduced version. And the next layer works just the same, but then works on the processed information of the previous layer. So the deeper you go, the more abstract the information gets and also the more compressed it gets. So whilst initially it looked at edges, if you go a little bit deeper, edges might become lines or curves or certain textures might become something like a gradient. And the deeper you go, the more these information becomes like semantic information where an assortment or an assembly of certain dots and edges, the model might recognize as a face or as a door or something. And which at the lower you get, the more it allows it to kind of figure out concepts. And uh, so if you look at this kind of uh, neural networks, as I explained, there are different stages in the recognition. So, and usually kind of we separate them into like, let's say three parts. The first one is really looking at, uh, let's say the, the style, the decoration, really elements like textures, um, well, certain structures. The, the middle or the lower part is then really about content where we, well, where things like eyes or faces or cars are detected. And just before the model is able to decide, let's say, make this decision what it sees, there is something called a feature vector. And that is, for me, a very important thing because a feature vector is kind of a very compressed version of, of, the, of the image. And 
it is a vector like in geometry, only that it doesn't have like just two or three dimensions, but it has usually a few hundred or even a few thousand. But what this vector does is puts every image into a multidimensional space at a certain coordinate. And when a model gets trained, it kind of tries to kind of put, push every, every image like that looks similar, or it tries to transform this uh, kind of this space in a way that images that look similar end up in this latent space uh, in similar locations, which then allows the model to say like, if it wants to decide if it's a cat or a dog it sees, well, in this latent space, all the cats are somewhere in one area and the dogs are somewhere in another, and then it can just say, okay, everything that's left of this hyper plane is, a, is very likely a dog and everything else is a cat. But yeah, we have a difficulty imagining how this space works, but fortunately there are techniques that allow us to break down these multidimensional spaces into two dimensions so we can uh, get kind of a sense how this, how the model sees its, the, the visual world. And well, what you get is actually something that looks very much like a, like a map of some kind of unknown country. And as I explained before, what happens is really at some point, like these are 100,000 images uh, that have been classified by the model. And well, what happens is really the cats end up in one space and maybe, I don't know, cars end up in another space. And uh, well, because it's multidimensional, it's not totally true because maybe the painted cats live in one country or in one area, the people in cat costumes live in another one. So, but it is a good way to imagine kind of how, how these models see the world because it's different how we see the world and they look at different aspects of images. But the amazing thing is that this latent space now allows you to, well, to do mathematical operations with images, compare them, measure distances and uh, well, and uh, yeah, in a way this whole visual world becomes a tool that you can mathematically manipulate and, and well, and explore. So one example where how you can use this is, uh, is a classification example. So if you take a lot of artworks, like, uh, uh, well, like for example at the Google Arts and Culture where I have this uh, artist residency, uh, well, we have this database of uh, over half, over half a million uh, cultural artifacts, like that, which spans really like painting, sculpture, fashion, uh, ceramics. So in a way, everything that kind of can be captured as human cultural artifacts. And well, the question was if I can apply the concept of six degrees of separation, which is this idea that in on in our, let's say in our world, everybody is connected to everybody else over just a few steps by saying like, I know some people who know some other people and if I do this chain by kind of acquaintances, I can end up at, at any person in the, on the planet and find a very short connection, which is usually just never longer than six steps. And so my question was, can I do the same thing with artworks? Can I ask the question, how do I get from Starry Night to, well, the statue, uh, the, the Venus of Milo or so? So, and how would that relationship work? Because, I mean, there we have here painting and we have a statue. Well, and uh, I wanted to, to ignore all the metadata and just you really take the visual information like the machine gets looking at uh, depiction of the painting or a sculpture, taking the feature vector and then building this, this huge map and, uh, and then connecting all the nearest neighbors saying like, okay, this painting visually looks similar like this other one. So I, I draw, well, almost like a road between them. But then how, if, if I want to get from this other one painting to another one, well, I have to, like a car navigator, find the shortest pass along the road. And let me quickly show you how this then looks because here, for example, you see how to get from one painting from this portrait on the one side to this Buddha statue on the other. And well, all the machine gets is the visual information contained in the image. And you can see that it has some sense of, uh, of course, of color, of, of texture, of structure, but it might have a, a very different way of understanding images like we do because I mean, 
a curator would probably never put images in this kind of order. But I find this approach very interesting because, uh, well, we have enough curators and there are like ways to present something. But for me, it's an option to make discoveries in a huge collection which we might not necessarily kind of make or like to go for. Because yes, we have certain, uh, certain ways of, of approaching things and uh, like we prefer to look at the metadata. And if you have now more and more access pretty much to all the data in the world or a lot of data, the question is always how do you find something you don't know well you're looking for. And so this is one way to, to allows for serendipity and also to discover things that are not so obvious. So, because you can start with things you know uh, on, on the beginning and the end, but then along the way you will be able to discover things that might be kind of related to what you like, but uh, it might also get you into territories that, well, you might not initially be, that might not have been a place that you had been starting to look for in the first place. and. Uh, so I think, think that is a kind of an interesting approach now that, uh, well, with this overwhelming amount of data that becomes available to us. Because otherwise we will always still find kind of the kind of, well, we will be driven by what we already know. And that's usually kind of like a, a small part of what's available. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was, uh, of course, I wanted to talk about how I do generate art with, uh, with these neural networks because of course you cannot just classify but you can also in a way invert the process so when i have this latent space where every kind of every position or every coordinate in this multidimensional space has a visual representation i can ask the model okay tell me how how does it look here what do you see here and so there are multiple ways of doing this but well, the very simplest way is really like, you know, where you invert that model that I showed you before. So where, like, originally you have the, the image and in the end you get this feature vector. Well, you can just say, here's a feature vector and build me from this an image again. So some early results, oh yes, and I, I, I call this technique neurography because for me it's kind of like neurophotography. Uh, because I am somewhat like a photographer in these latent spaces. So just like a photographer goes out in the world with his or her camera and, and starts framing it, looking for good angles uh, or interesting spots, well, I go into these models that I actually shape or train or build, and then I can really move around and find the, the areas that are more promising than others, because that's what happened that even there, not everything is interesting, quite the opposite. There's a lot of, let's say, redundancy. So the first uh, kind of approach that I did was uh, using this paper because as an artist, I'm now extremely dependent on, on, what signed, on the research that scientists do because, well, I, can, I am a programmer, but there is some knowledge that, I mean, I don't have the lifetime to, like, to learn all that. And fortunately, with open source and uh, actually all this science becoming much more open and uh, like uh, ArcSIF and, and things like that, so that people like scientists are sharing now these models and they share the source code. And so for me, this is great because then I can go to GitHub and take the models from there and try to kind of see how I can shape or kind of take them and apply them for my own uses or abuse them. So this was the, the one that is kind of like, was a very early one that came out about two years ago, which kind of really took a trained classifier model and then you could kind of force it to, to, to show you what it thinks, uh, like, uh, like it kind of tries to maximize noise in such a way that at some point it, uh, it becomes something visible. So this is kind of like a flight through this latent space, but I asked the model not to become too concrete. Uh, so what we see is really more like abstract shapes, but they are, well, Sometimes they seem to re remind you of, of at least, let's say, kind of a visual uh, vocabulary. Uh, it's not just noise. It is really things that, uh, well, because the model in a way also looks at certain elements and 
because it also gets the input of how the world looks. And there are certain statistical properties about how how we, we or machines see the world that don't change between us and the machine. So, and that's what the, mach, what, what the model picks up. And well, then I, I can just uh, produce kind of ran, go to random spots in this, in this abstract space and uh, I get these things that might remind you of, well, maybe some abstract art. And, uh, but really, in the, I just curate this. So I have the model go through these images and uh, produce me a thousand variations. And in the end, I, well, I pick the ones that I find interesting. Maybe I try to tweak the model. Like I can continue to train it, or there are lots of hyperparameters that you can change. For example, like in this case, how concrete should the model get? Like how close should it get to, let's say, a realistic image or not? Um, but yeah, uh, but about a year ago, or let's say a year and a half ago, GANs came came on the market or was were developed. And this, I mean, I'm, by now probably you have heard about them, generative adversarial neural networks, because this is kind of, for me, the, the most amazing uh, approach to, to solving this. And uh, well, I guess I have to quickly explain it. So the principle of a GAN is it's actually two neural networks. One is a generator network, which uh, well is supposed to generate images that look somewhat like uh, images in a training set you give it. So let's say I give the model a, a folder full of Picasso images. Then the, this, this GAN is trying to produce images that kind of look like other Picasso images. Uh, but well. There is a kind of a, a counterpart, which is another model that's called the discriminator. And that model is uh, supposed to catch the, the, the generator as a forger in a way. So the, the generator produces an image, the discriminator looks at it and says, uh, OK, I, I don't think this is a real Picasso. This is a fake. It, well, the thing is, of course, then it tells the, the generator it thinks it's a fake, and the generator learns from its mistakes. Because so it kind of tries to improve what it did wrong in this process. Uh, so the next time, it does a little bit better. At the same time, the better the generator gets, the discriminator makes more mistakes and lets sometimes uh, a fake Picasso uh, pass through. And well, of course, it can kind of like look at it in the after its decision and say, oops, I made a mistake. And then also learns kind of what it, like what it has to look for uh, to get better in this process. And so in this feedback loop, both models <clears throat> start getting better and better in, in producing images that look like the data in the training set. So eventually, these models become so good at, at faking it that uh, our human discrimination senses uh, become kind of tricked. And at, at some point, we cannot distinguish a, a generated image from a, a fake, uh, like from a, a real image anymore. And this GAN approach is extremely powerful. And there are kind of lots of different methods of doing it. Um, but I, well, in the following, you will see kind of the, the explorations I have done with this. Um, there's one flavor of, uh, of this GAN called Pix to Pix, and maybe you have seen it before. Maybe you know this edges to cats example that made the rounds. So the principle in this case is you give the model, well, an input, let's say a sketch, something like a, an, an image with reduced information, and the target, which is the, the, the true image, a painting or a photo. And then you ask the model, transform me the, this kind of information that I will give you into this other form. And uh, so you could do this with edges and cats. What I tried to do it was uh, to train a model uh, to, on, on pairs where I give it a very blurred image and, uh, and uh, the, the original image, and uh, then try to kind of make it well, enable it to reconstruct the information that was lost in the blurred image so I get a sharp image again. So this kind of pairing. And you know this effect from, from the movies uh, where somebody kind of sitting in the police uh, department and there's a very blurry image of some kind of uh, culprit and then they, they ask the person, oh, can you enhance that for me? And then magically uh, the face appears. And so I tried, can GAN solve this? Well, this is what I got. 
So on, the, on this side, you see the input that after training the model on uh, 10 thousands of examples, this is what the model then outputs. And yes, it's not exactly kind of the, a real image, but for me, this was a much more interesting image because what you see is kind of very interesting new types of artifacts that develop. And well, there, well, you can it definitely produces uh, well some new kind of abstraction there. And I call this technique now not enhancement, but I call it transhancement because yeah, it kind of more transforms the input than it does enhance it. But that's where then for me as an artist, it becomes much more interesting because yes, I'm, I'm not working in the police department. I'm always interested in finding novel imagery or things that I haven't seen before. And these kind of artifacts or these kind of, kind of transformations it does to images, I find kind of, uh, well, definitely something in the details I have not seen as a natural process yet. So it is a kind of new aesthetic I'm getting out of this. Also, the fascinating thing is really that the model has to invent new information. So, because if you have a blurred image, there's not much information left. And so the really the model, based on what it has seen, uh, what it has trained on, it really has to, add something to the input. So it's not just a transformation. Um, and so what happens, I can, for example, infinitely zoom into this, and then what was before an eye can, becomes kind of a strange landscape. And uh, so definitely, ah, yeah, here we have the Mr. Catman, which I always liked, uh, <laughs> kind of. Sorry, but I always have to look here because I couldn't uh, flip the screen. Um, OK. well. The example that I showed you just before were, well, had one little problem that, in a way, I was still taking content I found on the Internet Archive or taking photos. And of course, that's kind of, you could say, it's more like a filter. And the idea where I want to get to is, of course, that the machine autonomously starts even generating the underlying structure, really, like that I don't rely on, well, some, some creative work of a photographer or other people. I want the model to become as autonomous as possible and at the same time be able to produce really a huge range of, uh, of, of variation. So, well, the first thing I was trying to do was uh, maybe I can, well, create my own content by, well, for example, asking the model to turn a stick figure, like you know when you have the little models as an artist, uh, into something that looks like a photo or a painting. So using the same GAN approach. Well, to do this, at first I used, there are fortunately some neural networks out there where, for example, you can show it a photo and then it will look for persons or, or people and extract their pose out of the photo. So it even works with lots of, lots of people on the same photo or dancers. And so doing this, I can feed my model with, again, 10,000, 100,000 of photos. So the model learns how humans are usually posed. And I, I start this huge collection. I can then into fly through this space of potential poses. And it actually looks almost like a, a dance. But so this is not from a video. It's just, in a way, the probability space of human motion randomly interpolated. And well, then again, I can train again on giving it an input of a little stick figure and the original photo. And if I do this long enough, in the end, I get things like this. So on the top, you can still see the, the input that the model gets. And this is then what, what the GAN has produced. Again, you see these kind of typical, well, I call them not GAN artifacts, which, uh, well, this is now a year old. So it's also probably something like a short thing that happens now, and the better the models get, we will not see them anymore. So maybe in 20 years, we will look back at these artifacts and say, oh yeah, it looks like, uh, like something like the GIF format or something. So uh, it might date these images very clearly as to be 2017. But again, now I create my own content because all I do is I create a random post by, by going into my post database interpolating, extrapolating, or just randomizing a stick figure, 
feed that into the model, and I get something out that, well, at least looks like a, some kind of painting or art. I'm not saying that it is, but uh, it definitely reminds us of things that uh, somebody could have painted. And, uh, well, yeah, and these things have the kind of the, the tendency to remind you of, of several things. So this might remind you of Dali, and uh, this might remind you of Francis Bacon. <laughs> so I'm getting that a lot. So it's very hard to escape this, kind of like try to get into this world where you create something absolutely new. Because if it's, if it's really new, then we, I will probably, or we will probably not really be able to, to, to read it yet. Because we haven't developed the language to read new images yet. So at the moment, I'm this space where I, I pick people up with something that is still a bit familiar but still tries to get a bit outside that space. So, but yes, unfortunately, Francis Bacon had a really kind of in this, in this latent space of things that remind us of something, he has a lot of gravity in there. So one, the moment you, you do something with faces or bodies that are not looking, that are looking uncanny, yeah, it's very hard to escape Francis Bacon. Um, I did a collaboration with an artist uh, called uh, Albert Bark Duran, and uh, he approached me when he saw this project and wanted to say, like, see if we can turn this kind of idea into an artificial muse, where he is a painter, and uh, so he becomes somewhat like the the well, just. Uh, the manipulator, or the, the well, almost like the slave to the machine, where the machine tells tells him what to paint, and then he goes and uh, in a performance of three days, he he got this image and then painted this in oil on canvas. So where we, in a way, invert the roles of uh, who is the creator and who's the well, well, who is the inspiration, something like that. Um, well. I didn't stop at, at bodies because, uh, well, there are certain elements in images that humans find always very interesting, and especially other humans are very prone to, to make us curious, or a human face, for example, is, is kind of a very powerful image because we are all experts in human faces, and, and a face contains so much information that, uh, well, the moment we see it, we, well, we start analyzing it and trying to understand, like, is this person happy, sad, or um, is there something wrong with it? Uh, like, you get very quickly the uncanny effect. And, well, but, yeah, so in, in the attention economy that we are in, kind of faces are, like, as you see it in advertising since ever, faces are very powerful tools to, to grab our attention. So I went out and see what I can do with neural networks that help me to generate new faces. So again, the, the process is very similar to the stick figures. I first use a neural network that extracts uh, biometric face markers from photos. <clears throat> they look usually like this. So you pass it a photo, and then you get the information where the mouth is, the eyes, uh, the, the jawline. And then again, I can train a model that, uh, well, I give it this biometric information and the photo, and over time, it will start trying to learn the aesthetics. Like, as an input, I get it, give it then this kind of sketch of a face. And as an output, for example, here, uh, I get these images that look like they come from old, uh, old books. So this was an early experiment. I used the British Library collection because there I had lots of faces. And yes, on the left, I can then just randomly interpolate through this kind of face space. And on the left, I get output that, well, still looks a bit kind of like you see the problems. Uh, right now, I definitely see them. Um, but yes, I have now this, uh, this tool that allows me to, well, make my own people. And uh, one thing, ah, oh, there, now there might be sound. Uh, one thing that I could do, to answer the question was, of why I can the take, I trained a model on, on, to on the music, music video showing Francois Hardy. And uh, because, and oh, let's falsehood. have a quick look. Why did he do so, that? It undermines the credibility of the entire White House press office no, it on doesn't. day don't one. Be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave 
alternative facts to that. But the point remains wait, wait. Alternative so, that facts? Alternative facts, four of the five facts he uttered. The hey, one Chuck, thing he why, got hey, right Chuck. was Zeke Miller. Four of the five facts he uttered were just not true. Look, alternative facts are not facts. They're falsehoods. <laughs> so what I did, I trained a model on, uh, on, on several music videos uh, showing Francoise Hardy because I realized I need, like these models do not have a lot of fantasy. So if I train them on portraits from a book, usually portraits have their mouth closed. So, uh, and if a model has never seen an open mouth and you try to give it like a face marker with an open mouth, it will not know what to do. In a way like humans again. So if we, we haven't seen it, we also have a very hard time imagining it. So I trained in on these music videos because that gave me a lot of material. And then there, well, this infamous interview with Kelly and Conway came across. And what I do is I take the face markers from Kelly and Conway and map them onto, uh, onto, the, onto the model. And that allows me, and that was more than a year ago. And now, of course, we have deep fake and all these things. And now we can do it much better. Uh, but at that time, it felt like kind of a, a way to, as a warning sign, because yes, these things are getting now really, really good that uh, at some point we will not be able to tell anymore if we are looking at something real or fake. So I started to improve now my model. So as I said before, I'm using these, uh, these models that scientists share, and of course, this, the progress is so fast that we pretty much every week something new comes out. But at the same time, well, they sometimes focus on certain aspects. And one of the things I'm doing is I'm starting to improve those models or to certain things. So for example, with this, I kind of try to make a model better at skin and, and hair. And you see these are, well, trained on white, young, female photo models. So there's definitely a bias in there. So, but uh, that's kind of where you get very good quality and uh, like quality details, photos, and, uh, and a lot of material is out there. But of course, that is now the, the problem that, uh, well, I introduce bias into the data sets and to the models that I train by picking what I train the model on. So in this case, yes, I can now do kind of realistic images, which is actually not my my goal for me, being able to produce juices is, is more like a, a benchmark to see how good have my models become. I, I don't well. I, well, it, it might be something like a, a, what's this a Pygmalion thing? Not sure. But uh, in the end, because we are all experts in faces, uh, and I, I guess I am too. If I generate a face, I can very quickly see kind of if, what is wrong with the model. What, what does it do badly, and where do I still have to improve something in the process? So for me, in a way, these things are more like how good have I become in, in generating these images so that later on I can, I can always kind of degrade it. I can destroy the model or make changes so I get something more interesting. But well, being like not being able to produce the, the the good quality is of course then more like a cheap excuse for saying oh yeah I can't do it any better but this looks nice and abstract. Um, so what I did also is I, I trained uh, another model that generates faces on old portraits. So because of course again there are lots of uh, libraries or websites out there so I can just go harvest these portraits. And these are actually all generated already. So, and you can again see a problem in this case with art history that the paintings that I picked are mostly European and it's either showing kind of middle-aged or older men and a bit more younger white women. So again, this is now the problem that there we have to, well, find better data. But uh, well, from, for me, of course, again, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting how the model can capture the essence of this. So when I train it on photos, I just get black and white. If I train it on paintings, I get that kind of aesthetic, which, well, definitely, well, it is very pleasing, again, uh, I guess. So it, the, the color scheme and these things. So and now I can start playing with the model. So I've become better. And uh, for example, I can now do almost real time things. Uh, so this is like picking my face up and at the same time transforms it using that paintings model. And uh, because the interesting part is then when the model makes mistakes. So or because in this case, I have two models. One is detecting kind of face markers and then passes it on to the second model, which tries to make faces from that. And 
on every step, the model introduces error, and that is actually where the interestingness happens. So again, we saw kind of the, the Francis Bacon association if, if the model doesn't get enough information. Uh, the thing is that the model, uh, which has only like the detection model that I've trained that looks for faces, only knows faces. So anything I show it, it will always try to, to make faces out of it. So even if I just draw a very badly drawn kind of sketch of a face, it, uh, it, it starts generating a face, even though it has never been trained on sketches. So this is not edges to cats. It's really whatever you give it, it will, it will see faces in it. And uh, so that is, of course, a kind of interesting approach where now you can really transform anything into anything else. Uh, the same model, if I give it something that is, has been drawn by more of an expert, well, the results already look better. So Picasso to something Picasso-ish. It's not style transfer. Um, I, I said that before. The, now, when you have a model, you can start uh, experimenting with it, because in the end, it's a huge digital file. What I do here is, well, you have, I, I told you about the layers and the weights, that kind of the, the, what the model learns, it, it stores in these in weights. So in that case, it's, it kind of controls how these convolutional filters work together. And what I do here is, so this is kind of if I pass in the regular face markers through the model. And these are the steps when I kind of lobotomize the model and kind of uh, delete certain parts of the weights or set them to zero. So you can see it's almost like these examples where an artist gets Alzheimer's or so, and over the years starts losing their abilities. So in this case too, so from, so here, I guess I have deleted uh, over 50% of what the model has learned. But there is still kind of a resemblance. Uh, you, you can still see something. And so, of course, these spaces are much more interesting for me to explore visually, because there I might find something that is, uh, well, that I haven't seen yet or others have not seen yet. Um, ah, yeah. So again, the, if everything, if all you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So yeah. I, I painted a little face on my finger, and uh, again, it sees uh, faces everywhere. So it, it is, opens a lot of uh, room just for playing and, and fooling around, of course. And uh, well, some of these then, like, yeah. I always see Titanic there, but somebody said, oh, it looks like uh, it's uh, looking for lies or so. <laughs> um, Yes, so what I do now artistically is really my, pretty much training new models. And the whole world is my oyster now because whatever I see, whatever I go, I can kind of try to train a new model on and to capture a certain essence of that aesthetic or that structure. So for example, these images are made by, I, I found this beautiful collection of old glass plate photography. Um, on Flickr commons, and the, they have beautiful artifacts, like the kind of fungus and, and scratches. And I tried to train a model on kind of only learning these artifacts. And then again, it, well, it works. I, you just really give it uh, a few thousand photos, transform them, and then anything I feed in, either it's something other models have produced or a photo, this is actually kind of a face generated by the face model, and then I run it through the next GAN, which then produces this decay aesthetics. Ah, yeah, this is the, the, the image from the... Uh, this has been trained on, a, on kind of a collection of old machine parts, uh, some sketches from, uh, like, I think this was uh, pipes from uh, old, old engravings, uh, toy robots. Uh, again, another toy robot. So I like this. For me, it's, it's, uh, I feel myself almost in the tradition of the surrealists here because uh, in a way, well, I, it's like when Max Ernst takes, takes a bark, uh, a piece of bark of the tree, puts a piece of paper over it and, and starts rubbing through and then structures emerge. In the same way, I see these models working that, uh, well, I feed something in and then I start seeing, associating things, and, and can take it further. Uh, a model that has been trained on, uh, on electron microscope imagery. 
Uh, here is kind of a tiny uh, pumpkin emoji scaled up using this model, using the electron microscope imagery. Um, and yes, now compared to the earlier results, I can do all, also a lot of like better resolution. So again, this was kind of a photo and I can infinitely zoom in and it will always generate new details, in this case from the electron microscope images. Uh, ah, so quick clap. So what you see here, uh, because I, I was talking about kind of this idea like how do I actually generate novel content where I almost have no doing in kind of dis defining what the model should produce in the sense that it starts from existing structure or from existing content. And what I do, uh, a way I found that works pretty well is the feedback loop where I have usually one, two or more models and it starts usually with noise that gets fed in the first model. It transforms the noise looking like the hammer nail thing for what it has been trained on, passes it on to another model, and then the output of that model gets fed back into the first. So, and what happens is in this feedback loop, almost the essence of what the models have learned gets extracted. But because the models make mistakes on the way, it's kind of an endless transforming uh, stream of information at which almost like kind of the weather, it's hard, you cannot really predict it anymore. You can just predict it in very short term, but it quickly emerges into weird spaces. Um, another model, so especially if you take models that expect a different input than you, than you give it, it starts creating very strange shape, so this almost looks sculptural. Um, I would like to have some technique where I can have nanoparticles controlled by, by magnetic current that I could actually build a sculpture in a big tank. Well, maybe we get that at some point. Uh, or you can get really strange uh, by, again, it's actually the face model, uh, so you see kind of uh, a sense of skin and hair and things. Uh, there is some facishness about it, but in the end, yeah, for me, this is almost like an endless stream of potential information that I can take further. And then I can, well, take a snippet of this, run it through a bigger model, and get out these uh, strange abstractions or strange uncanny worlds um, in which, really, the content I have not, there's not, actually any photo underneath anymore. All the structures, and that's what I meant with the surrealism, that all the structures are really kind of self-enforced uh, by the model. And only in a way, because I look at them and recognize something in it, they survive. I mean, otherwise, if I look at them and I wouldn't see anything, you wouldn't probably see them now. And some more, yeah. So this is then where you get these really strange worlds uh, that are, well, somehow familiar, but then they are not. Uh, and yes, thank you. That's uh, that is it. <laughs> Mari, it was a great uh, uh, introduction into our collective unconscious or new, or a new perceptual unconscious that is like <laughs> machinic this time. You know? <laughs> this latent space has become a, indeed a kind of machine unconscious separated from ours. Yes. And we tried some time to visit. I'm sorry, now it will be a bit of anticlimax because my uh, uh, talk uh, will be highly theoretical. <laughs> trying to uh, sketch, but you know, in the attempt to sketch a basic grammar, also political grammar, theoretical grammar, into this new universe. I appreciate how Gregory introduced me uh, at the beginning and the stress he gave to this idea of information compression that somehow is affecting subjectivities today. You have new form of compressed subjectivity. And probably your imagery, uh, Mari, was clearly a good example of this. Uh, I slightly uh, changed the title of my um, talk that now is uh, World Models and Bias Automata. Again, on the logical and political limits of machine intelligence in the attempt to, uh, as I said, to um, develop a kind of a common um, 
theoretical and political grammar for a world that is highly uh, dominated and influenced today by computer scientists, mathematicians, and engineers. And of course, humanity, uh, philosophy, political science are a bit coping, <laughs> a bit trying to catch up with this, um, with this revolution. So again, I would like to thank for this invitation, and I will, um, I will start. So my attempt today with you, uh, and, and I will try to be simple, because I, I try also to expand to uh, escape somehow uh, a kind of very professionalized discourse uh, around AI, is how to secularize artificial intelligence today. And artificial intelligence, the dream of the mechanization of the human mind, is an old phenomenon today. So it's time to analyze with empirical and historical methods in order to understand also other uh, dramatic application, for instance, to the automation of labor, that is a less romantic outcome. So I go a bit classic here, but it's necessary to uh, start a conversation and maybe to scale up to further dimensions later. So we have two approach. We can approach AI from the point of view of a technological invention or from the point of view of a social application as a technical machine and as a social machine. What Deleuze and Guattari once noticed about the clock can be applied to artificial intelligence. You can look at the clock from two sides, as a technical or a social apparatus, in terms of mechanical gearings to project universal time or in terms of a new discipline to control collective time. The two developments are, of course, imbricated and stimulate each other. But probably, as in the case of Foucault's research, it is the social composition that tells the truth about a technical dispositif, that is able to reveal those social multiplicities that make a technical apparatus possible and powerful. Nonetheless, the study of the logical form of machines helps to understand in which way they incarnate, as Guattari once said, a hyperdeveloped and hyperconcentrated form of human subjectivity. In the case of artificial intelligence, the drive to automate the human mind, human perception and skills encounter around 10 years ago, or around 20 years ago, we can discuss, a third information revolution, that is the explosion of the network society into a society of data, metadata, data surplus. In that way, artificial intelligence morph into a more secular technique of machine learning that emerged as the most advanced tool for the analysis of such overproduction of data on a global scale. So in this sense, artificial intelligence, aside indeed from some kind of uh, fantastic aesthetic application that Mario just introduced, artificial intelligence today is a response to a control crisis of the information society. Historian James Berniger described the information revolution as a control restoration against the economic boom of the United States after World War II. Machine learning today should be considered as a control response to the surplus of data triggered by the network society. And in this sense, as the most effective technique, as I said in the abstract, of information compression. I know that is very uh, anti uh, religious, anti-mystical to discuss the artificial intelligence in terms of information compression, but I do this as a kind of provocation also to secularize some kind of mystical drive, animistic drives that exist in the AI discourse. But of course, maybe we can keep um, all these terms together. We will see which ones they have uh, a better political application. So this is a materialistic ground I propose for the study of artificial intelligence. As I said, very anti-mystical, anti-religious approach, and not at all concerned about consciousness of machines and similia. Artificial intelligence is here more prosaically the project to control the future of commodity production, logistics, collective behaviors, aesthetics, and labor. Many things. Indeed, one of the interesting um, things to underline is the fact that this kind of algorithm models that Mario just introduced, they're like somehow universal. They've been developed, you know, at the beginning actually to automate perception using 
um, the visual data set as a training data set, but then they became a kind of universal dispositive that could be applied to a completely different form of data with different outcomes, but with, with a sort of kind of universal idea behind. Not universal, but also what I'm trying to do today is to simplify the discourse of machine learning and machine intelligence and to sketch a few basic um, um, elements. So, uh, indeed, my proposal is this. Machine intelligence can be described today as composed of three elements. Mario beautifully illustrated uh, in which way actually they can become very um, seducing. This, this approach of mine is very dry, very conceptual. So, machine intelligence today, sophisticated system, but mm, basically composed of three elements. World data, input data, training data, data coming from the world. Two, a model that describes this data, a model that is built on this data. And three, an output, an application of this model, and that Mario described very nicely, different application. But first, I would like to frame the nature of the first layer of information, just to do a bit of media archaeology, to go back to find some kind of um, other um, source of inspiration. I propose to frame this evolution of machine intelligence as the passage from a linear form of digital information into what we can call computational geometry or computational space. Digital information, that is the encoding of information into a string of binary digits, 0 and 1, is the prerequisite, the extreme simplification, to accelerate computing. The strings of binary digits have been always considered a passive target of mathematical operations. But there is clearly a topological turn happening with the first neural networks and following machine learning systems. Information, data from the outside world, started to provide some rules for its own computation. In fact, rather than neural networks, it would be better to call them computational networks today because the biomorphic influence uh, disappears soon along their evolution, and today they are studied simply as mathematical constructs. They don't have anything chemical inside left, so to speak. We could frame this as a passage from passive information to active information, and there are more historical examples of computational spaces and computational topologies. You can take the cellular automata by John von Neumann, 1948, or the Rechnende Raum by uh, Koran Suse, and of course the Perceptron itself by Frank Rosenblatt. Also Turing's um, last essay, uh, The Chemical Basis of Morphosenergies, 1952, can be considered in, can be considered in, the, li in the lineage of self-computing structures. Von Neumann cellular automata and the SUSE computational space, they're very blurred there, but just, I mentioned them as just uh, historical references. For Newman cellular automata and SUSE computational space are intuitively easy to understand as spatial models, while Rosenblatt's neural networks engender more complex topology. So it's also my attempt to show that all systems of machine learning today including support vector machines and Bayesian networks, including convolutional neural network and the recent capsule networks by Geoffrey Hinton, are at the end models of computational topology. In this sense, part of an old tradition that is of ours combinatoria, in which one element follows logical instruction according to its topological relation with other elements. But I proposed, I, I, I tried to do with you this kind of historical excursus, mathematical um, excursus, just to stress the pressure of information coming from the world and its transformation into self-organizing and generative structure of machine intelligence. So I'm trying to show somehow a form of uh, social historical pressure coming from data that is transforming the way data are computed. Okay, let's talk about the second element. This was my attempt to uh, somehow introduce the first layer, that is the information. Let's talk about the second element, that is the model. And uh, as you can tell from this um, diagram, 
here we have no artificial intelligence that is somehow autonomous in itself, that contains in itself some kind of secret wisdom. It's a system that is in a continuous symbiosis with a human operator that controls different parameters, select the training data set, select the output, and also with the outside world. But let's focus on the model. The second element of the diagram is the world model, the model built on world data to describe and compress those data in the most efficient way. You can call it the model, and computer scientists call it the model. The business of machine learning is about extracting a very simple world model from a vast amount of world data to have a simplified model of the world at hand, an abstraction instead of a full complexity. This world model takes usually the logic form of statistical distribution in the case of pattern recognition, for instance, or of statistical inference in the case of Bayesian networks for automated decision making. This statistical model of world data is what people refer to today as artificial intelligence, just this. There's no autonomy of reason here. It's a statistical model of world data. The third element then is also to, is the output. What do we do with this system? We can do pattern recognition, classification, a lot of interesting aesthetic projects. So this model then is used for a specific task. If neural network emerged originally as a technique of pattern recognition, today machine learning prefers the most abstract and accurate expression input-output mapping to remove any reference to biological inspiration and visual perception. And also here, I try to be a bit provocative. Rather than talking about artificial intelligence, I want to talk about input-output mapping. The input clearly can be something extremely complex, the output something extremely simple. And it is indeed in this compression that the business and the politics of AI is played. So given an input of visual data, the first neural network by Frank Rosenblatt in 1957-58, the perceptron, could learn how to recognize a simple letter. This is a canonical example of pattern recognition. Today, given a complex data input, such as the live recording of a busy street, the neural network of a self-driving car is asked to steer mechanical gears and to take also ethical decisions sometimes, you know, not to maybe run with the car on a uh, children coming out from a school and so on. And this is another, this is a more recent example of input-output mapping. And for me, it's interesting how in, even the discourse of computer science today, you have this super dry, hurried concept that are taking over the old, uh, more romantic, idealistic concept of artificial intelligence. So we said that machine learning achieve a specific goal, pattern recognition, classification, even decision making, by building a statistical model of the world by different technique. The most popular still is based on a deep neural network. The world model has to be very simple, versatile, fast to run, and not very demanding in terms of energy, memory, and CPU power. And all the current system of machine intelligence aim to be just this system of information compression between a given input and a desired output. The flow of compressed information can be described by a cone or a trapezoid, like I do. On one side, you have data from the world, the input, and on the other, the desired output. Only the information that is considered crucial, such as a specific pattern, has to be filtered out. In the middle, you have the model, the world model. The smaller, the better. But information compression is achieved always by a statistical model that tries to condense the most accurate description of the world. This statistical model is a statistical description of simple shapes, such as numbers, for instance. And I could mention the example of the first, um, one of the first databases, the MNIST database, uh, that contained 60,000 handwritten numbers uh, and was used uh, by uh, American banks, American post offices in the attempt to automate basically the reading of the postal codes on, um, on letters or the, um, the figures you have on check when the check were like automatically uh, brought deposit in a bank. So this statistical model um, try rather than um, memorize 60,000 different pictures 
it basically uh, condenses and registers only one image. I'm sorry, only one file. Only one file that is the statistical description of this um, data set. But this abstract machine, has, uh, it would be important to stress, has three modalities of operation. Training or learning, application, and generation. If you like the word pattern, and this is interesting, important for me also working uh, with students, with our students, you can say that the three modalities are like pattern learning, pattern recognition, pattern generation. What artists like Mario Klingman do today is like with neural networks is mainly using the third function. This is the generation. Here I did this, uh, this very basic um, three diagrams to describe this three function. This one is the training mode in which indeed the model is constructed using a large amount of word data. This is the testing mode of the application in which, uh, for instance, in the case of pattern recognition, a simple file is recognized or classified. And the generative mode is the interesting one in the sense that um, a small primer that probably Mario can describe better than me, um, um, you basically, you feed the model with a, with a small, with a fragment of a picture or a small um, um, fragment of a melody and then you ask the model to complete the picture, to complete basically uh, the space, uh, the distribution. And uh, this is an important, um, function because in this way we understand, we see what the model has learned, how the model actually sees the world. And here you see the difference between human perception and machine perce perception, for instance. However, um, information compression comes with information obfuscation. Neural networks model uh, can work well, but often we don't know how. We talk about the black box effect as sometimes we cannot reconstruct backwards the computational passages that brought to a result. Training remain mysterious. We could end up with two different models that give us the same result and we don't know how and why. There are many projects actually out there today to try to uh, reverse engineering this black box effect and actually um, we have no time to discuss this today. But let's discuss abstraction as um, information loss. So production of uh, also new abstraction, new concept as a form of information loss. The, the power of machine learning uh, is about algorithm and equations like neural network, Bayesian network, support vector machine that can extract simple models from large data sets. In this process, a lot of useless information is damped Learning indeed is forgetting, but good information happens to get lost too. Information compression always comes with information loss issues, such as bias amplification. So one thing is you use neural network to make art, one thing if you use neural network, for instance, to control flows of population, uh, you know, planning, uh, you know, measuring the health insurance uh, potential of some uh, candidate and so on. So there are like indeed, um, political application, and more social application, and other that are more um, aesthetical, so to speak. So the statistical models of machine intelligence are like lenses of telescopes and microscopes. They allow to see invisible scales of being, but at the price of some distortion. But looking carefully, any form of intelligence is a distortion. And at this point, we should discuss what a good word model looks like in the terms of machine intelligence and how a model is asked to fit the word data. If a model is asked to fit its training data, this, do, this does not necessarily mean that the model has to be extremely accurate or pedantic. If a model is trained to recognize human faces, it will have to maintain a general, loose and tolerant picture of a human face in order to include, hopefully, also anomalies and deviation from the norm. And from this, you can immediately grasp that these statistical models are also new forms of normativity, when used indeed, you know, in terms of control apparatuses and so on. A fitting model is a model that is well balanced between overfitting and underfitting. An overfitting model is a model that follows too closely the training data that is unable to generalize beyond the given data set and sticks to specific occurrences of a pattern. 
A neural network trained with a database of only white people faces may not be able to recognize people of other skin colors as humans, as it happened. An underfitting model is a model that fails at extracting a meaningful and consistent pattern from the data set. Its model would be too generic, too open. And in this case, a neural network, for, for instance, would fail as it would recognize any object as a human face, for example. There are also other issues within model fitting, and my favorite indeed is apophenia. That is the event in which a system recognizes patterns that actually are not there, like humans do when they see a mountain on Mars uh, as a human face. And we could define apophenia as a sort of regional or partial fitting. But um, you can understand that this uh, kind of limitation of the system have immediately um, ethical, political, economical consequences. Are a serious problem, for instance, overfitting and underfitting, are a serious problem for self-driving cars. An autonomous vehicle should not recognize human figures from an advertisement poster as real pedestrians, a case probably of underfitting. Or it should not fail at recognizing a new car or obstacle only because of its new unexpected design, because it looks a bit different. Again, if the task is to generate and explore visual glitches, it would be extremely interesting. But the task of object recognition, industrial automation, and military reconnaissance, for instance, is something um, more serious. And you don't want much improvisation in that field. And the result can be catastrophic. Indeed, it's interesting that you train a neural network to improvise free jazz, but you don't want a car to drive as a free jazz musician plays the piano. And conversely, you don't want a model that pedantically describes the style of free jazz. A bit of information loss and error is crucial in art. So, a bit compressed, but <laughs> still visible. Any statistical model, because of information loss and logical constraints, mirrors, amplifier, or introduces bias at different stages and scales. And machine intelligence today is, should be discussed also from this point of view, in terms of incredible information compression technique, but also incredible uh, bias technique. So what is the bias in machine intelligence? It is necessary to distinguish between word bias, human bias, and machine bias. Bias is already present in the social inequalities of the world, we know. Data sets easily mirror race, gender, and class inequalities that exist in our society. Machine intelligence here does not have to record or, and remove social bias, but it often aggravates the problem. Information compression often um, amplifies bias, making inequalities more unequal. In this sense, machine intelligence is an apparatus, not just of normalization, but I would say of abnormalization that introduce anomalies and bias. In between world bias and machine bias, the role of human bias in building the training data set is still crucial. Training data sets are often built by computer science university, IT corporation, and military agencies with a very rough approach using basic taxonomies and cheap labor that make this data set a poor mirror often of world culture. If you think, for instance, the data set that are used for uh, object recognition or image recognition, they can be very effective, but they sediment specific, actually, uh, worldview, so to speak. So, and the selection of this data set is never a neutral and innocent operation. It's indeed is the work of a curator. There is no machine intelligence without training data, and when training data set have to be built from scratch, anonymous and cheap labor is the source often via the division of labor provided by Amazon Mechanical Turk that outsource these tasks sometimes of labeling of images and objects basically to precarious cognitive workers from the global south. So given the bias amplification effect of machine intelligence, is something like bias reduction conceivable in machine learning? What does it mean here, transparency, accountability, and collective control? We can discuss maybe um, at the end. And also, machine bias can affect um, the categories and taxonomy through which we see the world. Machine learning, in my opinion today, is the source of a new computational normativity that extends the institutional normativity of the 19th century into new definition of the normal and the abnormal, 
clearly I refer here to Foucault. Foucault has shown a statistics as being using to expand all taxonomy and has been instrumental in producing new ones. Now this process via computational statistics, the, what people call AI, is automated and in the hands of corporations and states that institute new norms of behavior, social status, and, and, and indeed norms of physical health and mental health. For instance, unsupervised learning of medical data can autonomously institute the division between healthy and unhealthy people from the physiological point of view, but the, the outcomes can be very critical when it's a matter you know, of labeling classifying psychopathologies, trying you know, to predict um, schizophrenia. So in terms of how machine intelligence is able to normalize affects, uh, state of mind, Psychopathologists, I have the feeling we didn't discuss anything yet. We are at the very beginning of a, of a research and a debate. And in this case, AI indeed is the new governance of the abnormal. It's the prediction of social anomalies and their control, in my opinion. And the same we can say, scaling up in this um, um, diagram in this view um, of AI is not just bias, social bias, it's also the way we construct, um, we, we, um, we live within the taxonomies, for instance, uh, our, of our culture. Um, and indeed, I made this simple, uh, I was, in this diagram I mentioned here on the right, of course, the effect of information loss category normalization and taxonomy reduction. It's clear that uh, machine intelligence as a form of information compression, when applied you know, to social data set, cultural data sets, has to get rid of a lot of information. That produces um, incredible effect on, um, on the category that we also use, for instance, to see um, um, or cultural heritage or visual heritage, for instance. Okay, to conclude, um, intelligence is not about knowing everything of the world, but developing a model of the world. Machine intelligence as well is about making a world model. In the case of machine intelligence, this world model is just statistical. Such a statistical model of the world works well because it compresses a lot of information, while at the same time being able to generalize to new context and unexpected scenarios. Any word model is a partial perspective. Indeed, anthropogenesis, semiogenesis, and in general technogenesis, that is making new tools, happen by simplification and multiplication of simple skills, tasks, and functions. Machine intelligence has imitated some features of human cognition and perception and simplified them via statistics in order to accelerate them. So I would say that the, the imagination we can exercise with machine intelligence is only possible with the awareness of this inbuilt distortion. Like the awareness of the distorting lenses of telescope and microscope uh, a few centuries ago, that we have introduced a few centuries ago. And now indeed we see um, the world through the eyes of what I, I perceive as an army of this bias automata. This, system that automates somehow um, not just our um, intelligence but also our distorted perception. Thank you. Uh, so just one question because I think between your two lectures there's something like two worlds, very different world. Uh, first a new realism for you and for you a new normativity. Something mm, like a new yeah, normativity. Yes. And uh, I want uh, to know what is the relation between this new realism and this new normativity. If I may say, I mean, this kind of nightmarish latent space that Mario was showing, it could be taken as a good metaphor also of a, of a political unconscious. This is not just a joke. It's a matter of, in my opinion, that Mario probably is a different, it's a matter of a kind of mathematical complexity that stays somewhere and control, at least in the field that I try to study, what is today, you know, network of logistics, in, uh, flows of uh, communication on social media, and so on. So I'm looking at that, at the application 
on uh, social material. But I would say, um, yeah, it's the, same, it's the same universe. In the case of Mario, it's more like collective perception and aesthetics and the cultural heritage and the troll. Yeah, well, I, I rather felt that we were kind of like, uh, our talks were actually not on the opposite side. It was kind of like uh, pretty much, well, they, they're complementary, yeah. So, um, so in that sense, uh, I, well, well, I can only agree what you said, <laughs> saying, yes, that maybe the, the, the tendency to, to bring out the uncanny, like, yes, in a way that it's, the machines have this tendency to emphasize the, the bias in the data and which is visually uncanny, but there is also this, uh, maybe, yes, so there might be this feeling of uncanny, I don't know what the term will be when you apply it to social data or other data, and that will, Yes, so give us a different feeling of, of living. Yes, so this, that it extrapolates certain tendencies that are already present and sometimes might take them into areas which make us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But then there's always, it's a feedback system. So in the end, I guess it's usually kind of, it overshoots and then the, it learns. And so I guess you end up again with something, well, with something different, but, uh, now we are going to extremes and hopefully that process will revert again into like, for example, the idea that we, re we see now how machines emphasize bias, which is already in the data. So realizing that we already uh, make ch like accommodate for that or try to actively change data sets. So it, I don't think it's always going in just in the wrong direction. We have this self-regulating process that people learn. And, uh, and so I have hopes that it's not all going badly. <coughs> My question is the uh, first orator. Uh, in, the, in the first part of your speech, uh, your problem, your, your work was to connect the nodes in the network with uh, an ontology. Say so, or with label and names. Uh, are you in contact or with uh, the, the DARPA project, uh, XAI, Explainable AI, which has put uh, one million dollars on, uh, <laughs> on the table to ex explore that? Uh, uh, XAI, yes. Uh, actually, which project is that? So, is XAI, that, Explainable hmm? Artificial Intelligence. Ah, okay, no, well, actually, no, I <laughs> have not looked into that. Uh, and of course, like, especially now when I'm working, I am relying on already labeled material. That is the nice thing, uh, it, being in this game right now, that, or the danger that the models I train have already been trained on other models. So let's say even mistakes that have been made early on, they will multiply in the future. And uh, but so in the end, so it's actually not the problem anymore for me to, to label things. I'm are rather using tools other people have built and maybe I can send information back into the system and see where, the, where something is missing. But in the, yes, so, uh, for, for the labeling and the classification, I'm relying on other people already, like hoping that they, they do, do a good job and not, well, and of course, as we know, it's not always the case, but being aware of those kind of like lapses or things that are missing, of course, you can try to stay clear of them or counteract them. But yeah, so I mean, yes, there's the explainable AI, well, visually, of course, there are also other things like the black box. Like, I, I actually don't see that black box approach anymore like that. For me, uh, it's more like getting, like when you work with these models, you make a model in your head how they might work. And just like you play, like learning to play an instrument first, well, you are very coarsely trying to make something. But the more you work with them, be it a violin or a neural network, the more you, or, or a dog, <laughs> a puppy, the more you interact with another entity that is kind of like, not just like a, a button, but has reactions that are complex, you start getting a feel for, well, it's, it's more like a feeling, but you, you understand, you can predict how it will behave. So it's not all just a kind of surprise anymore at some point. So I learn, 
subconsciously how I work with the models. And so, and for, for that, for me, it's not really a black box anymore. I can already know, okay, if, if the model does this, and I don't like it, then I train it differently, or then I have to change it here, and I know if I just find the right parameter space, it will produce something better. So it's really like learning how to, to uh, uh, interact with this unknown entity, which it's, is fascinating. It's interesting how this, indeed, this black box hype is used also to somehow often to communicate the kind of, or even to instill a discourse of AI obscurantism, mm -hmm. in the sense that AI you know, is supposed to be too difficult to, to be studied or to be really under, understood, that maybe only a few people can re understand. And actually, it's not, it's not something to teach today to a new generation of students, because we do require too many. Actually, it's not the case. But the issue with explainable AI is indeed the fact that um, the, the problem there is ethical decision. So explainable yeah. AI, indeed, uh, sponsored by DARPA, is like when it, a kind of autonomous system or autonomous vehicle takes a decision in a crucial situation and you want to know why. <laughs> you don't want to follow the machine blindly. You want to have some reason that basically are the, the previous computational step of the previous layers of neural networks that are kept, that are made visible to show why the tank is turning right or left, why uh, an enemy is detected. So it's interesting how, again, is the military that try to uh, develop, to debunk the black box myth, but for, um, yeah, crucial, I would say, uh, deadly uh, issue, deadly decision, but still related to ethics and autonomous weaponry. Uh, hi. Uh, I think there is something that hasn't been really discussed uh, and that is visible in Marius' works and which really illustrates what we've been saying about human bias, machine bias. And this is really on the aesthetic side, like with what is really recognizable in, the, in these works. And it's the fact that you, you have only been using like works of art that are really that, that are already respected, that are already like, that have a legitimacy. Like, you've been picking works from uh, like great museums, everything, like, most of it makes us think of Fra Francis Bacon, which is someone who already has an aesthetic, like, which is uh, really ap appreciated by most of people. Like, this is really, already norm uh, normative. And uh, the fact that the works that the, the machine is producing, are also really clean works. Like, there is something really clean. It's not like glitch art or something like that. There is something like, there is something like really fluid. Like, <laughs> like it's like a, the machine was only producing harmony when it's being feed, uh, fed with uh, this kind of works. Like, what would happen if you took like really bad works of art? If you, if you took like uh, really, really bad, uh, I don't know, ugly pictures and you fed them to the machine? Uh, well, what you saw was already my filtering process, of course, s selecting a kind of a, a tiny range of potential stuff. Um, I have things that look very glitchy or very kind of strange. Well, lots of them remind you of glitch art because, well, every model expects a certain information, like a range of data, and, but you can always f f put in totally like, data that is out of their expected range, which will usually f lead to images that are visually out of the range. But aesthetically, well, they always look like noise or let's say like very like kind of aesthetic noise. But that's the whole point that there is only a certain limited amount of, uh, let's say, images that make sense to us visually that we can see shapes in. Um, mm starting from simple abstract shapes or going to photorealistic textures. But, uh, well, we are visually trained on the world we see around us. So uh, once you deviate from that, yeah, so the interesting part happens actually exactly at the boundary where you can escape from that known visual space. But very quickly you get into area that always just looks like noise because what looks like noise is things that you don't, un like noise or like total entropy is where it's too much information where you haven't developed the vocabulary, the visual vocabulary to read it yet. But I, I have, can show you tons of work that, uh, that is in that aspect, but really I just uh, currently picked for this talk things that, uh, well, 
in a narrow range. So it's possible, and they can be dirty and uh, and very harsh. It's, you can cover the entire range of of visuals. So mm -hmm. I would say. Well, that's also the beauty. I mean, uh, you never know exactly what you get, but so it's somewhere between noise and and uh, and redundancy. Mm. Uh, I have a question for you, Mario, as an artist in residence at Google Paris. Um, what kind of people do you meet, and could you use Matteo's thesis point of view in a discussion with those people? Is there a kind of a separation between artists and engineers, things like that? My question is, how can those two worlds communicate or not? And I'm sorry it's mean, but don't you sometimes think that you are kind of legitimation for them well. to, to show that they are able to do three things, etc.? Okay, I can of course just speak for myself. I cannot speak for Google. Yes. So. Um, well, for me, being there, it's interesting because as an artist, uh, you get, well, first uh, an insight into how this, like, well, the company that probably influences all of us most by kind of providing our search results. Well, from what I can see, it's, uh, well, at least, like, I'm, I'm at Arts and Culture, which is already this non-profit. Non well, there's definitely, an openness to be as diverse as possible and to cover uh, the biggest range of, uh, of, of what we see as human cultural, uh, like, uh, well, like everything that spans human culture. And there, whilst it started with, let's say, European, like the, the museums and the collections where, uh, well, of course, you have like art history or the way it's told is, of course, very Eurocentric and very. This, but there, I know that they're active, like actively, uh, the, the arts and culture tries to diversify as much as possible, give voices to underrepresented uh, cultures, people. And the same thing with artists. Uh, in the end, uh, I guess right now, the. The, the way how you approach them is is kind of not not clear, but well as well actually I can say like everybody who is interested in working with the possibilities that that, that let's say Google and engineers there have to to explore machine learning data and stuff is always welcome to to just call and I'm pretty sure there is open uh, like he or she would be welcome with open arms. So, of course, there's always this thing that, well, I, can't, I probably cannot do any controversial projects within uh, Google, let's say, because that is kind of, uh, well, there, like once you, there is a big company, you cannot really, like, you, well, you have seen that, right? There are, for example, there was this project by, by Cyril, uh, the Art Selfie, which uh, was kind of where you had the camera, it would, like, analyze your biometric face markers and then look in the cultural database available to the institute uh, for the, your lookalike. And of course, immediately the problem became apparent again that the data is biased as hell and people who are not white and uh, within a certain age range, well, get kind of uh, always the same, I don't know, 100 pictures or, or less. So because simply the data is not there. And uh, if you look, so there, so in the end, it's how do you deal with that? So don't you do the project or like, of course, so the reaction as I see it is like, well, try to get more diverse data in. And so I know that's being actively worked on. Uh, am I a poster child? I don't know. So is, was, let's say, Michelangelo, Michelangelo poster child of the Catholic Church? So there are certain like uh, entities in the world which uh, kind of have means to make big things happen, and that's usually kind of like big companies, or let's say in earlier days it was royalty or the church. And as an artist, you always have to kind of find ways, like if you want to make things happen, and, and want to get a bigger audience. And from, well, so yes. But right now, well, if some people want to see me like that, uh, be my guest. I, I feel like, so the, right now, I feel like I get a lot of opportunity to, to do things. And, but at the same time, I still have the freedom to do 
uh, like it gives me the freedom to explore other avenues which where I am just myself and, and uh, so for me it's a good solution and uh, again I know that we are actively looking for like non-white non-male artists uh, who are doing this so the problem is yes I mean anybody who, who, who sees this now please contact us because I mean there's always the thing like how do you find them I mean I know a few but it's it's even though the field is uh, kind of growing to, to see people actually who are doing this, well, you sometimes just have to get forward and say, here I am, look at me, come do something with me. It's like not, you, sometimes it's hard to, to, to not get, to get found if, if you're just at least not kind of trying to, to make yourself heard. But yes, does that answer the question somehow? Yes, yes. Okay, but again, so this is just my personal opinion. Uh, maybe uh, two questions to Matteo. Uh, the first one is how to struggle against, uh, fight against uh, the theological uh, artificial intelligence. The theological model. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yes. How to fight because it's... Uh, it's uh, Do you have, have many believers in Paris? What? Do you have many believers in Paris of that model? Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, now, how to, how to... Because the, the, the understanding, the religious understanding of artificial intelligence is very strong. Uh, so, and, and, what? Oh, uh, Recurs Vars, Singularity yeah. University, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big stuff in, uh, no, I, I don't That's speak about France, about, yeah, sure. about just yeah. the world. And the second question is, uh, um, uh, Mario speak about the generative adversarial network and the difference between a generator and discriminator. And there's, uh, ad, ad, uh, in your introduction, Introduction, you speak ab about uh, Guattari, Felix Guattari. There's a link for you between the generative adversarial network and the schizo machine, the schizophrenic machine. Or can you, can you make the difference between, because there's something strange with uh, generative adversarial network and the split between uh, uh, the generator and the discriminator in this uh, kind of uh, software. That's a very nice question, very uh, complex, I would say. Uh, I would like to go back to the Google issue, but anyway, let's <laughs> give it a sec. Okay, now it's interesting, even the... In you the, can begin by Google. Yeah, I go very quick. The generative adversarial model is interesting that actually you see this sort of pyramid that you can point one against the other. You compose, you know, uh, chains of neural networks uh, that follow each other. You compose a very um, complex chain. In that case, uh, it's basically one model that tries to imitate the other, try to respond to the other. And uh, I don't know, in my opinion, this statistical model are always and often a system of normalization. There's, there is, I, my question also philosophically, aesthetically, is how much they can open up, how much they're, are they really uh, schizo machines, like you were saying. So it's indeed, um, if I may say, they're like a claustrophobic universe. Once you set the training data set, you work within that uh, universe. And then maybe you can you know, discover incredible things, I'm not saying. But it's interesting, it's a, it's a form of indeed uh, in, inbuilt uh, claustrophobic uh, schizophrenia. That was the second question, right? Yeah. Okay, and the first one was, I forgot. It's about, uh, re uh, the, the relation between religion and, and artificial intelligence, and how you if can I may say, make the secularization of uh, artificial intelligence. It's a form of mystification. So what the, the animist drive or the way newspapers are covering artificial intelligence are like basically mystifying the form of labor economy that, that are incarnated by AI. For me, it's interesting how today the system are fantastic system for the collection of collective knowledge. In the past, also here in, in France, you have like, I remember Pierre Lévy, like in the 90s, talking about collective intelligence, you know, model of um, the general intellect by the Italian post -operative. The very, you know, um, immaterial abstract notion. Finally, we have machinic system, machine, algorithm, and equation that actually are a very empirical way to uh, condense our knowledge, to measure it, to produce model, statistical model of this knowledge. So it's interesting how indeed, uh, this is basically when we talk about autonomous um, entities, consciousness of machine singularity, we're mystifying this process. No, and this is, this is the interesting thing. Um, so this uh, basically, we have finally an empirical model to collect social data, to map cultural heritage. 
And the problem politically is that inf this information compression that I described in very arid term is also a problem of, of uh, capital accumulation because this system of inf information compression on data produced on a global scale have produced basically uh, an accumulation of a specific uh, accumulation of power and um, you know profit in a, in a specific part of the world that is California. So it's also an issue of sovereignty. No, this incredible um, monopoly on data, this monopoly of artificial intelligence today. So information compression comes with an incredible asymmetrical accumulation. And in terms of accumulation of capitals, the uh, data, um, big data revolution, the AI revolution that is basically uh, governed by uh, California, North California, <laughs> I may say, is one of the uh, largest accumulation of capitals uh, I don't know, yeah, after the economic boom in the United States and the, uh, world, after World War II, or you know, if you think about the process also that produced the, um, the British Industrial Revolution and the, you know, the kind of concentration and accumulation of capital. Now I see this incredible flow of uh, concentrated in terms of this platform capitalism around AI only in North California. This is an issue of sovereignty for all the other states. Of course, there is another big player, this is China. <laughs> it's not only. <laughs> So anyway, so this is an issue of sovereignty, I would say, today. Hi, so I have one more question for Mario. Uh, you say that in your work you have a lot of, you have a creative work, and have you ever tried to model it and to fit it back in the Latin space to constrain it more? You mean like I train a model on my own decisions in a way? For example, like that the machine starts learning kind of my curation process. And yes. Uh, yes, uh, that you can absolutely do that. I have various approaches there. So one is uh, really, well, I have tools. Because of course, first, it, in order to learn, it has to know what I like and what I don't like. So it's very like a binary process. But mm -hmm. yes, so again, it can just, uh, in the end, it, gets, it produces an image, it produces a feature vector, and if you remember that map, mm -hmm. I could just map that into things I like and things I don't like, and if there is a pattern among, in my personal taste, it will detect that. Uh, the other thing uh, that I trained is actually a, a Twitter bot, it's, called, it's novelty. There's this idea, in a way, because of course, well, novelty is, of course, not an something ideal to strive for, but right now I'm looking for, for example, to produce visuals that look different to other visuals I have done before. So I can, again, map this space. Every item has a position. And because novelty is kind of visual dissimilarity from something that already exists, I can look like I can set a boundary saying like, I only accept an image if its nearest neighbor in all the known images is further away than a certain uh, threshold. And uh, that's quite interesting what happens there because then it shows you again the bias of the model that classifies the data. So the novelist is on Twitter, so it really looks, follows uh, over a thousand other Twitter feeds that, that produce a lot of images from all kinds of uh, traits. And, um, and well, the first thing I had to realize is if I've set a fixed boundary in the distance, like how, how distant, different does it have to be from what it knows? And you, for example, like take a virtual, like some arbitrary value, like it has to be bigger than two, whatever that two might mean very quickly you will not be able to fill any spaces in that space because uh, it's like a, a sponge and well you will not find any novelty so actually what you have to do you have to constantly lower the threshold for what is still considered novel because uh, otherwise it's like well like if you are interested as a human in something and let's say whatever what could it be uh, food or so, uh, well, at some point you have eaten everything, so you have to get refine your tastes and, and distinguish between the finer things. So it might look very, taste very similar, but you, well, ah, there is still a fine difference. So you constantly fill up the space, and uh, so that's what the model does, and I was going to the bias. So the model that I use to classify it is kind of a very common one, which is uh, the, an older version of Google Net, which is, and that model has been trained on, uh, on kind of the typical objects, but it also ha has been trained to distinguish uh, 150 dog breeds. So it is an expert on dogs. 
And then what happens is the model looks at an image and whenever it sees dogs, it has a very finer way to distinguish them. So two dogs, the distance between two dogs is much bigger to itself than the distance between two humans. So, so in that aspect, I would have to train my own model or a continuously training model to to, to, to get that novelty aspect. Right now what the, model, the bot does is it, uh, like it uh, posts a lot of, it retweets a lot of puppies but very little humans because it is kind of, uh, has this twisted way of, of uh, kind of a twisted rubber mat kind of space uh, distance function in there. But yes, it's totally working. And there are other things, I am is there, uh, a company which does that thing on photography uh, where they detect this, the kind of how aesthetic people will find a photo. It's of course always mapped on statistics, right? That's the problem. So every like you make uh, kind of, well, you will just get more of that same thing. But again, so if, if lots of people like, I don't know, certain Instagram kind of look, the model will think that is actually beautiful. Whereas of course, after a while we get tired of seeing all that thing. So but there's the power of the models. They, you can always force it to say, okay, stay away from that space, uh, stay, try to find uh, something else. So whilst it is emphasizing certain tendencies, you can always, unlike humans, you can always forcibly try to find another space that is not as obvious mathematically. That is where I, where I find the beauty and I can train a model on a different aesthetic if I wanted to. That was long. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks to you. Thank you.